So welcome. Today we have, um, we're switching it up a little bit. Today we have a speaker from, from industry. We have Cheryl Paradis, who is the vice president and general manager for BA, BA Systems Fast Labs. And she's gonna talk a lot about and she's learned throughout her career. She started as a design engineer and has, has made incredible accomplishments working across many fields, including airborne platforms and electronic warfare. Before she served in her current role, she served as the director of optical EW systems, the optical EW systems product line, um, and the deputy general manager for Fast Labs before taking her position um, as the general manager. Um, she has a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Embry-Riddle University and an MBA from Riviera University. So she has a, a very distinguished career and she's going to speak about um, a lot of the experiences she's had and the lessons she's learned. Um, I encourage you all to ask questions, take advantage of the access you have to someone who's had so much experience and so many um, accomplishments and so much she can offer you. Um, type your questions into the chat. As usual, I'll be moderating. Um, and at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Cheryl. Cheryl, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Jennifer. Can you guys all hear me okay? Yes. All right. Very good. So it's really great to be with all of you today. There are quite a few of you, and that's awesome. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about myself and my professional journey and also a little bit about the incredible problems that my team gets to solve every day in Fast Lab. So I hope you enjoy what we're going to talk about. Um, so before I jump into my own career at BAE, I thought I'd give you a glimpse into what we do at BAE Systems um, and what we care about, right? We are a leading provider of advanced technology, um, primarily focused at the defense and aerospace sectors. Um, but we do have a heavy commercial complement there as well. So we are 89,000 people strong across the U.S. and 40 countries um, and about 35,000 strong in the U.S. Um, as we sit here today. So um, very big footprint. And um, but yet BAE is not really that well known in the aerospace and defense sector. And, and, and probably one of the reasons is, you know, we, you know, we kind of quietly do our work and, and have some great products out there um, and probably don't toot our own horn enough, but I work in a particular segment of the business called electronic systems, um, where we focus on really delivering state-of-the-art electronic systems for all of our customers. So in the hexagon that you see on the slide right now, if you go around the outer edges, you can see some of the types of systems that we offer in BA systems, electronic systems. So as an example, if you were a pilot um, in one of the armed forces and you needed to be warned that there's a threat that's near you in the air or imminently focused on you, um, you know, we have products and services that address those needs. We have high quality surveillance, getting into unknown areas, figuring out what's going on, secure communication between vessels, whether they be in the air, under the ground, right? Across all of those up in space, we've got, we've got processors on the Mars, every Mars rover that we, we've uh, deployed up there. Um, so we're kind of in all of the domains um, in many, many of the products. Um, so it's, it's really cool. Our mission is we protect those who protect us. Um, and we at BAE try to live that out every day. Um, through the game-changing electronics that we provide. So our goal is to really help our warfighters complete their mission safely and effectively and come home again. Um, but it's really a fascinating place to work. And um, I've been here nearly 30 years. I definitely didn't intend to stay for 30 years. I was kind of on the five-year plan when I started, but I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but you notice right in the center of the hexagon, is the Fast Labs symbol. So we're gonna talk about why Fast Labs is right there in that graphic. So let's, um, I'll give you a little bit of background on me before we jump into more about BA systems. So, <laughs> um, you know, after 30 years, almost 30 years, I've kind of learned from my career what's important to me. And you see a lot of that on the slide here. Um, that word cloud represents a few, uh, like a few key pieces of my life and um, the size of the words don't necessarily correlate to their importance. However, 
um, you see my three kids kind of featured and highlighted that they're definitely at the center stage and the biggest centerpiece of my life. Um, but I grew up in upstate New York um, with my parents and six siblings. So there were seven of us, very, very close to Plattsburgh Air Force Base. And I, that's actually where I fell in love with aviation. I used to lay down kind of in the grass outside of the perimeter of the base and watch F-111 aircraft uh, do short takeoffs and landings and, and go through their training courses. And so I just learned to be infatuated with, with aircraft and aviation. Um, if you look at the map that's up at the top right, that red arrow is the Plattsburgh area. And I actually grew up right on the Canadian border, so north of Plattsburgh. Um, I'm the middle of seven, um, which comes with its own share of challenges growing up in a big family. I don't know if any of you have big families too, but uh, my nickname growing up was Switzerland. You, you guys probably um, don't recall um, why Switzerland was ever anointed as a neutral country, but it was previous to World War I and you know they became known as neutral or impartial in global affairs. So my nickname growing up was Switzerland because I was always the neutral one right in the center pulling the seven of us together. So had a lot of fun growing up in big families. Um, I'm also a hobby photographer. So the picture in the lower right hand corner is um, one of mine. I love the outdoors. Um, I have a place up on Lake Champlain. So I spend a lot of summers kayaking and camping and I love to take pictures um, of the natural beauty that's up there. We're gonna talk about this a little bit more, but my personality type, for those of you who know what Myers-Briggs is, is an INFP. So that really stands for an introvert, um, guided by my intuition, um, very, very in touch with my feelings and my perceptions, and they drive a lot of my leadership behaviors. Um, I can tell you, and based upon the title of this, this talk, that I am most definitely an introvert. Um, but all that really means is that I gain energy kind of by being by myself, um, not doing things like I'm doing today with all of you. That's not where I gain my energy from. So it actually takes a lot of energy for me to do this and put myself out there for all of you. But you'll, you'll find and you'll learn if any of you are introverted like me that um, it, it's, it's, it's actually a blessing. Um, it, it makes you a very different kind of leader. Um, but we'll get into that a little bit more as we progress through the briefing. So let's go to the next slide, Megan. Um, so this slide depicts some of the key pieces of my schooling and Jennifer mentioned some of it. Um, you know, I mentioned I fell in love with aviation. So I, I really sought out a university that would allow me to pursue an aerospace engineering degree, but also one that had a flight school attached to it because it was important that I got a chance to study up close and personal kind of aircraft control systems and aerodynamics. And I really wanted to have um, a flight school kind of adjacent. So that's why I picked Denver Riddle. And I, I grew up in upstate New York and I wanted to go to school far away. So I chose Florida. And so that's how I landed down there. Um, and so I got a job right out of college as an aerospace engineer with BA Systems. And I got to tell you, it was amazing from the start. Um, my first year, I traveled uh, to Australia and South America. I did a lot of domestic travel, spent a lot of time in California and Arizona and New Mexico, completely immersed in different programs and encountering like really exciting challenges at every term, you know, around and you'll see my journey line next, but every time I moved around, it was incredible. So 29 years later, I'm still here and I, I've actually just never looked back. Um, but you know, my first role as a design engineer, as it will with you, all of you, it really sticks with you. Um, it gave me a great foundation. Um, and from there, I went on to more technical leadership roles. Um, and, and what I really liked was working for BAE and getting insight into the kinds of missions that um, our customers, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, they execute routinely and what kind of technologies they need to complete those missions safely. So I learned through the, through the years how to come up with solutions that empower those missions. And, and it was both learning technically, but it was also very powerful and gave me a great tug towards the missions that we do as a nation. So that sense of purpose really kept me going through my career um, and was amazing. 
but you know, along the way, I gained more experience in the company that I worked for. And um, I found that I needed to go back to school in a different capacity. And that was to get my MBA, Master's of Business Administration. That was important to me as I progressed because although I did love the technical side of things, I also loved managing people and leading teams. And I needed a little more insight and instruction around business and finance and business operations. And so that's what I pursued and it was it was really good and it was a nice compliment um, to my technical degree. And I did choose a local university because at the time I had three little children and I had to balance kind of uh, being able to not take all of my time outside of work to be able to to traverse to schooling. And so, um, you know, when your kids are little, you, they don't notice if you work into the night on your MBA. And so that's how I chose to kind of manage that work-life balance. But I will say, and one of the things I wanted to just chat with you guys today is, you know, never stop your education, right? Never stop learning and growing. And I definitely have taken advantage of development opportunities at BAE and all companies offer them. Um, I've done week long in-depth topical coursework at Harvard Business School on campus. I've done international programs through some of the top international business schools abroad like Oxford University and their, their business school and INSEAD and their business school. So, you know, I put those on this slide really to highlight, you know, how important it is to never stop learning and growing and whatever company you choose to work for, you know, make sure that they enable that and also that you take advantage of it because it's really cool. Um, so my journey line is on the next slide. I just wanted to share a little bit of that with you all. Um, so it's a snapshot uh, from design engineer on one end all the way to the vice president of Fast Labs at the right. Um, I think I had every role in engineering over the course of my career. Um, and I did excursions from there, you know, into things like project management while I was still an engineer. And, and I personally never cared about organizational boundaries. So in different companies, if you're, um, you know, if you're an engineer, you're an engineering, if you're a project manager, you're in the project management office, I blurred those lines because I really liked to just um, follow what the company needed. And sometimes it needed me to go from being the project engineering manager to the project manager. And so I never really cared that, um, that I blurred those lines. So you can see I've had a huge variety of roles at BAE. Um, the takeaway I think here for all of you is really that diversity of experience is so important. Um, your ability to learn new things, to adapt to change, um, to work with different teams. Not every team is gonna feel the same. Oh, okay, just making sure we got the slide back. Um, not every team is gonna feel the same or look the same and you're gonna have to adjust your styles, your preferences to be able to engage and work deeply with those teams. But all of that makes you a really well-rounded leader and it continues to kind of fill in, make it fuller and fuller that picture so you can contribute even greater over time. So, um, you know, some people find that their diversity of experiences at different companies, um, but I found it all within BAE, which is a little bit unusual these days, um, but I always found that there was something new to go on or something new to explore, and I just kept taking those diverse experiences on with the company. So I'm, I'm not saying everyone should do that, but for me, it just really kept working. So you'll find as you get into your careers that the only constant is change. I'm sure you've heard that before. You can always assume that things will change, and really what's in your control is how you adapt and react to that change. And that's what really matters. So uh, I personally rank agility and adaptability really high on my list of key leadership skills. And the more diversity of roles that you take early on, the better and better you'll get at um, accomplishing those skills um, and, and overall you know, become a much better leader for that. Okay, so um, what else have I learned? What else do I have to share with you guys? Um, you know, there are other key lessons throughout my career and I have three that I'd like to share with you if that's okay. So the first is a concept that I talk about a lot within BAE and it's called building your personal board of directors. So for me, um, the personal board of directors are individuals with whom I've developed 
very strong mentor relationships with at different points in my career. And these individuals mean the world to me. Um, they've supported me. Um, they weren't afraid to give me really direct feedback when I needed it. And when I say direct, I really mean probably feedback I didn't want to hear, um, but feedback that I needed to hear in order to get better um, and progress in my career and figure out my next move. So whenever I change roles, um, as you saw in my journey line, I was always looking for a mentor in the area that I moved to, you know, someone that I could ask really dumb questions to or what things meant or how to interpret what I was seeing. Um, and then the individuals that I really gravitated to were ones that our styles kind of meshed really well and I resonated with, and then I never let them go. Even when I moved on, they stayed on my board of directors and they were go-tos for me to come back and ask, you know, career and development questions too. Now, being a mentor and putting yourself out there can be pretty scary, um, but what I've learned is that actually people like to impart what they've learned and share it with others. And if you have the courage to ask, chances are you'll like the answers you get back. And so, you know, I'm a huge, huge champion of mentorship. Um, and finding a mentor doesn't have to be difficult. Um, you should start local. It doesn't need to be someone who is assigned to you in school or inside the company you work for. It could be a neighbor, a teacher, and sometimes even a peer who's been you know, in role longer than you have. And then once you've found your first mentor, um, it's those individuals that eventually will help you identify other mentors in their network. And then that's how you get to build your network or, or what I call your personal board of directors. Um, and you know, you'll, you'll, you'll meet people and you'll mentor with them and some things will really resonate with you. What I would say is hold on to that. Uh, hold on to those individual pieces and tack them onto yourself because that's how you start to develop your personal brand. You can be a hodgepodge of things that resonate across your, your mentors, right? And bring those back to you and, and make them part of who you are as a, as a leader. So um, that's one thing that I did. Um, a couple more points. Um, you know, a mentor is someone that you can have a real open conversation with that, that you can ask questions to without fear of any kind of repercussion or that they'll change the way they think about you, right? So, so as, as you are forming these initial relationships, um, it's important that, that you strike up those conversations and that you feel good about having those conversations. But in a mentor relationship, it's equally important for you to be curious. Um, don't expect that your mentor will just <clears throat> impart like unsolicited wisdom every time you talk. You need to ask questions, even the difficult ones, in order to get as much out of the conversation as you can. I know my mentees today that come to me for mentoring, they own the conversation in terms of the direction they wanna take it. And the harder questions they ask me, the more intense the conversation and the better outcome of us having shared with each other. So. Don't be afraid to be curious. Don't be afraid to ask questions, even if you think it's a sensitive topic, because put it out there, chances are it's a topic that's been talked about before with your mentor and they'll have some good things to impart upon you. Okay. <clears throat> so next slide. Okay, so this, this lesson is really for any other fellow introverts in the room. And it's one that I work on every day. So as a self-proclaimed introvert, and I'm gonna use this in, in air quotes, right? I've learned how to be extroverted. You really can't learn to be extroverted. It is where you get an energy, but I've learned to be extroverted when I need to. And I really come to understand the importance of putting yourself out there. Um, that can be very difficult, but I can absolutely attest that it gets easier with practice. And that's why I've got three images of myself up here on this slide. It's not because I like to see myself through the zoom lens, absolutely not. But I wanted to share with all of you that in my current role as VP of Fast Labs, I've had to do a lot of public speaking engagements and public, spe public speaking is not historically something that's been my thing. Um, not that I can't do it, I just don't enjoy doing it. <laughs> so I've actually had, I've had to work at really getting better at this 
and not feeling anxious about it every time I do have to do it. <laughs> um, so I wanted to share with you, so very important mentor, right? One of my board of directors um, who's since retired, but still active and my board of directors once gave me a line that helped me every time I, I move forward to publicly speak. He said to me, remember Cheryl, they can't eat you. And so I've carried that line with me throughout my entire career. I still repeat it to myself before I speak in front of large groups. I repeated it today before this session. And I can honestly tell you that it just helps settle me. Um, so if you're an introvert like me, just think, you know, what's the worst that can happen if you put yourself out there? Um, or remember the line, they can't eat you, right? Literally, they, they can't eat you. There's nothing bad that can happen here. So whatever mind tricks that work for you, I would say employ them. Um, and then don't be afraid to take time by yourself after you publicly speak, as I'm sure I will do after this call, right? I'll probably need a nap, but that is just part of being an introvert. You have to know when it's time to recharge. So I just wanted to share that with all of you because I find that not a lot of people like to talk about um, themselves being introverts. And honestly, I think it's a blessing. And I think it makes me a much more sensitive, um, a much more intuitive leader um, and, um, it's been great for my career. So I would encourage you all to think about those words and think about um, your individual characteristics. Okay. And then the last lesson I wanted to share today um, is aptly called Beware of the Crossroads. Um, so just as I've had a lot of mentors in my life, I've also been a mentor to many individuals over the years. And often what I hear from someone from a very early career to mid-level is all about the crossroads. Um, do I go down this path or do I go down this other path? Like what's better for my career? So I'm here to tell you that from my perspective, there is no right path. When you think there's a right path, it puts so much added pressure on you to make the right choice, right? And it's the right choice um, to make the right decision. And it can leave you second guessing your choices later on down the line too. And it's just something you don't need to do to yourself. No matter which decision you make, which choice you make, I honestly believe there is something to be learned in every role, in every job you hold. It gets back to that diversity I talked about a minute ago. The more experiences you have, they will add to your unique mixtures of experiences, right? What makes you unique? Um, and all of those will factor into the leader that you will become. So I tell my mentees um, not to look at this as their, these points in their career um, as crossroads, but to look at each choice as just the next step in developing your unique viewpoint. There's not a wrong decision. And that actually takes the pressure off and lets you make the most of whatever that next step might be. So I'll tell you a quick story. Um, to illustrate a couple of the key lessons that I've shared. So when I was in the deputy um, VP role for Fast Labs, two roles before this one, you know, I had done that for about four years. I was ready to take the VP role. I was set. I felt so good about it. And so with one of my personal board of directors um, who was still active in the company and in my leadership chain, you know, I counted on for mentorship and guidance. And he's like, nope that role's not for you. Um, you're going to go do this other thing over here. And honestly, that's not what I wanted to hear. I was very upset. And I actually went to the other thing to interview, kind of kicking and screaming like a child, you know, going into the interview thinking, I don't want this role. I, I want to do this other thing. And so I'm not even going to, you know, I'm just going to do enough to get through this. And I got in the interview and the more we talked, the more I was like, hmm, that sounds pretty interesting. Huh, that sounds pretty good. And by the end of it, I wanted that role really bad. And I got it. And then I executed that role for four years. And I can honestly tell you, looking back, that my, my uh, mentor was absolutely 100% correct. I learned things in that role that I didn't even know I needed to learn. And so that advice that he gave me, even though I didn't want to hear it, I trusted him enough. I listened to him enough to be able to follow through with what he told me 
was the right course of action for me next. And he was absolutely right. But if he had asked me that at the time, I would have stuck to my story and said, nope, I'm ready. I'm, I'm where I need to be. But man, I was wrong. And so it just is a, is a, is a story to help explain that when you create your personal board of directors, when you work with your mentors, listen to them, trust them. They're only there for your best interests and they're imparting their wisdom and guidance to you. They, they should get nothing out of it other than the fulfillment of seeing you progress in your career. And that's really what it's all about. So I hope that you guys got some good, good tidbits in those three lessons. Um, you know, before we get into the Q&A, um, I did want to give you a quick look at my team and the problems we solve. Um, so that's where we'll go next. Um, so in Fast Labs, where I, where I lead today, we are the research and development arm of BA Systems. So you can see our vision on the screen here. Uh, we secure the future through fearless innovation, and boy, do we. Uh, that's what we strive every day. My team is fearless, and we take on the most toughest challenges that come our way from our customers that other people have said can't be solved. And so we dive right in and we, we take them on. Um, we're often referred to as the innovation engine of BA systems. I like that analogy um, because our job is to innovate and, and develop really disruptive new technologies that BA systems can then insert into our products and ultimately you know, help our warfighters. Um, with their missions and come home safely. So we really take pride in delivering um, science and technology and engineering breakthroughs for some of those toughest challenges that I alluded to. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, so earlier in the talk, I alluded to, you know, this, this hexagon in the slide here, and I brought it up again to show you that Fast Labs is right in the middle of all of those different business segments. And that's that's purposeful and key to our ability to be successful. So Fast Labs um, engages with all of those business in the outer circles um, to understand what their customers need in terms of differentiating technology and advanced technology. And then we develop those um, and we, we work in areas like autonomy, as some of you are studying, and microelectronics, and artificial intelligence, um, different kinds of sensors, state-of-the-art processing, um, cyber, whether it be offensive cyber or defensive cyber, and, and so much more. We are really in tune with our business portfolios, and we have a laser focus on developing the technologies that are going to make them better, smarter, faster, do their job much better for the future. And so that's what we do in Fast Labs. We tackle, I would say, major foundational challenges um, and we help our customers. There's an expression, exploit the electromagnetic spectrum. So in order for them to do what they need to do, they need to rely on key attributes of the electromagnetic spectrum. And our job is to make sure that they have access to it and can do that very well. Um, it's also to try to push more and more things closer to the sensors so that there's no time delay from sensing something and when decisions can be made to act on it. Um, and so that's our goal is to help our warfighters make their decisions better and faster um, through our products. So it gives you a little bit of um, kind of insight into Fast Labs. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. And I just wanted to share a couple of examples of the types of problems that our scientists and engineers are working on solving. Um, and I'll start with autonomy, given the focus on autonomy for this course. So um, when I say autonomy is huge as an emerging technology, I'm not kidding. It is, it is emerging everywhere in our Fast Labs portfolio. And what we really mean by autonomy is autonomous systems. So autonomous systems should be able to assess information that comes at them from multiple sources, right? It could be, it, it could be sensors, it could be from um, learning that happened offline. It could be coming from many, many different directions. So taking all of that information in 
developing a greater understanding of what's happening in the situation, right? What's new in the environment? Is there new signals? Is there new energy? Is what's going on? And then quickly integrating that and then acting on that new knowledge. So that's what we're hoping to do through autonomous systems with no human in the loop. So that's what we call mission systems autonomy. And it actually requires many, many different technologies to be brought together in order to achieve mission system autonomy. The other piece that's really, really challenging is in many of our applications, this has to be in real time with like nanoseconds to make decisions that could save a mission or save lives. So imagine that. So your real time aboard an aircraft, things are happening in the environment around you, new threats may be coming unseen, you know, uh, new information is across the electromagnetic spectrum. You've got to take all that in and you've got to be able to make sense of it. And you've got to be able to impart a, a decision within split seconds. So um, that's a huge challenge. And that is one that we are actively uh, working to solve in fast labs. I would say in the world of autonomy, the other challenge, and some of you may find this interesting is around trust. So if you're a human operator on the battlefield or in the command post, right? Are you going to trust what an autonomous system is telling you is the proper course of action, right? Does a human trust the data and the outputs of the system enough to adjust course, adjust um, an aircraft trajectory, an, an aircraft flight plan? You know, there's a lot that goes into accepting the outputs of an autonomous system and actually taking that decision-making on board and using it. So we're actually making a lot of progress in fast labs on this, but I think as an industry, we have a long way to go to be able to say that we have trust in autonomous systems. And that's also an area where a significant amount of research dollars are being spent today, which is how do you, how do you develop trust in these systems? So if any of you are looking for a unique aspect of autonomy to um, to take on as you head into college, that is a huge one. So that's a little bit about autonomy. Um, the next area I thought would be interesting for you guys to hear about and that we're placing a lot of focus is around unmanned undersea vehicles or what we call UUVs. And you can see a couple of examples on this slide. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, the conditions underwater are very different than the conditions in the air or in space, right? So having those unique environments to deal with um, is, is kind of the focus of some of our undersea capabilities at BA systems. But you can also imagine that, um, you know, the air domain is pretty conquered, right? We've got all kinds of planes and all kinds of capabilities in the air. The space domain is emerging. We've got great capabilities up there and more and more being added every day. <clears throat> the, the underwater domain is kind of a new area where um, we're actually looking at, you know, what kind of capabilities can we put together that can help our warfighter get better intelligence, better surveillance, better reconnaissance in support of their missions using that undersea domain. And one of those areas we're looking at is UUVs. So how do we take some of our great capabilities that are performing well in the air domain and translate those into UUVs that, that go pretty deep and have a lot of pressure? Um, they don't have the ability to use the RF spectrum, right? So you have to communicate different ways underwater than you do in the air. Um, so in fast labs, we're actually focused on advanced UUV development. So whether that be vehicles that can go deeper than today or further than today or faster than today. Um, we're also looking at novel ways to use these vehicles um, and developing the technologies that can um, bring some of those traditional missions into a UUV platform. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and it's a great area um, to explore um, uh, in terms of um, emerging. Um, I know you all are probably interested in some of the emerging areas versus conquered areas. So that's definitely an emerging one, the undersea. Um, conditions can be dangerous. Um, 
and we all know, um, as you see with the explosion of drones, right, it's better to send an unmanned vehicle into dangerous places than manned vehicles. So that's definitely an area to focus on, you know, and making these UUVs as smart as possible or as autonomous as possible because they're not easily able to, you know, you can't get them back easily and you can't um, expect them to surface and give you these different courses of actions that are possible. You really need them to make autonomous decisions. And, and so that will be game changing for our customers as we move forward. So that is another great area that we're focused on. And then finally, um, <clears throat> this is a very exciting area also emerging very strongly um, when we talk about quantum and quantum sensing. So um, think back to your, phys your physics classes and uh, quantum mechanics, um, but on the, on the defense side and then the BA systems and fast lab sides, we're really looking at how do we replace very traditional antennas um, where their, their performance is directly applicable to the size that they are. Um, and honestly, the technology we're using today was developed in the 19th century. So it's, it's actually still in the cell phone you're carrying, you know, in your backpacks and pockets today. So the quantum sensing work that we're doing in fast labs is really trying to understand whether we could develop an antenna made up of atomic gas that could sense the signals along the electromagnetic spectrum rather than needing to use these large fabricated antennas. The, the impact to our warfighters would be huge. Um, is we could fit, you know, a, a current antenna and its power that is today, you know, feet long into about one square inch when we figure out how to make this work. And so we just won um, a variety of um, science and technology programs where we're actually advancing kind of the state of the art of, of quantum sensing. And it's pretty exciting. And it could be the impacts for the warfighter uh, for our country could be they're measurable um, and it's really cool to be at the forefront of that so another hugely emerging area that needs great research uh, great engineering great scientists so something else for you all to consider okay so those were the three i wanted to highlight um, i hope that you got some breath some insight into the breadth of technologies that fast labs pioneers uh, from early science like quantum sensing to technologies that are being used today in the air domain translating into the undersea. Um, this has been great for me to share some of this with you. And so I'd really just like to open up for questions at this point. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That was really great. Um, so we have questions sort of in two different pieces. Some are focused a little bit on technology that you just spoke about and some on a little, a little bit more of your career. So maybe we'll take just a couple questions on the technology to start, and then uh, the time to the very many questions they have um, pertaining to the first part of your talk. But um, start with um, Mindy Kim. She had a question about what makes Fast Labs unique. Would you like to ask your question, Mindy? Sorry, I had trouble muting. Um, yeah, so I actually had a question regarding how you were talking about fast labs being in terms of the challenges that it takes on. And I was just wondering what sort of sets fast labs apart from the competitors. That <laughs> That's a great question. Um, thank you for asking it. Um, so, you know, I alluded to it a little bit, but um, we have a bit of a reputation for um, you know, not saying no to any hard problems, like probably some we should say no to, but we don't. And, um, and so our team is really motivated by solving that unsolvable problem. So I think, you know, it's not a comfortable place to be. Um, certainly when you, when you take a contract with another lab and you tell them that you're gonna to try to solve this really hard problem, you want to solve it. And so we can't always, right? But our team is so jazzed and excited to be trying 
And more often than not, we do. And it, 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 inco- it involves a lot of innovation and ingenuity and really understanding kind of the, I'll say the phenomenology associated with whatever we're trying to do. Um, so we hear that from customers time and time again, that, um, you know, that we're willing to take on some of the hard problems that others aren't. So I think that's probably what sets us aside. But there are, you know, there are many great companies who work on hard s and problems. Um, we, we wouldn't be the great nation that we are without all being in this together. And, um, and we do a lot of this in partnership with Lincoln Labs. So it is, it is, it is huge in the university system. So I think that's what sets us apart, but I'm not naive enough to say that, you know, we're the only ones doing it. Um, we just have a passion that drives everything we do to be able to solve things that um, previously have been unsolvable. That's how I would answer it. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you. Okay, so Arpan Kumar, question on UUVs. Would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Uh, yes, ma'am. Can you guys hear me properly? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. So I was really interested about when you were talking about UUVs or underwater, uh, underwater in the underwater part. And I was just curious about some of the, the major issues, if you could say, like in contrast, especially to land vehicles, um, mm-hmm. the major issues that would be in on an underwater vehicle? Yeah. Um, so I, I think it starts with, um, you know, buoyancy. So you've got to be able to go down. So you, you have to, um, you know, we focus on, I'll say the small to medium UUVs, not the really, really large ones. So, you know, how much power you can carry um, becomes a big driver. Um, and so, you know, battery technology is huge. Um, um, safety is huge because we are also looking at what it would take to launch UUVs off of submarines. And so, you know, batteries and submarines, right. you know, are not normally, you know, we're very, very cautious as a nation, you know, what we put on submarines because of the health of our, of our sailors there. But, um, you know, so, so you have to balance kind of what you want to do with the UUV in terms of its payload with its ability to power that payload and power itself for the length that you need it to go. So if you just need it to you know, go a couple miles and do something, that's one thing. But if you need it to go hundreds of nautical miles, do its thing and either come back or, or scrap itself, you know, that, that whole distribution needs to be thought through. So um so no. I, I, yeah, go ahead. I had a follow-up question in regards to that. I remember learning in physics um, about potential maps, you know, so there are areas of high, low potential gradients, et cetera. So mm-hmm. I, I was thinking like, if you're underwater, you have currents moving left, right, et cetera. If you could, yes. instead of going from a, uh, point A to B like that, if you could follow currents that are moving using like machine learning or something to harness those, would that be more effective? Because you, you'd be saving energy because you could just follow the water it's like swimming with the water instead of against it you'll go way faster absolutely absolutely you are correct and um and um applying machine learning to something like autonomy of the uuv is where we are today and so you know what you're thinking about fits perfectly with what we're thinking about in bae i i would say you know sometimes you need to go where the current can't take you but where you can harness it, you absolutely should. So I, I like your thinking, Arp, and that is exactly the kind of thinking that we need to, to take forward and put into kind of the, the mission lay down, if you will, right? Because it, it can't always be a straight line and maybe you don't have the energy for it to be a straight line. Really yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. You. Okay, so maybe we can shift gears a little bit. Um, Asitia had a question um, a little bit more focused on your experiences. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, if you're asking me, my name is Ishida. I'm sorry, Ishida. Thank you. Ishida. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about your experience as a woman in both engineering position and as like a director of VP, that kind of position. Those are two pretty different experiences from what I understand, but the commonality is still that you're a woman in STEM, which is very inspiring, which is why I'm asking. <laughs> so thanks, Tashita. Great question. And, you know, I mean, I have to my advantage the, the fact that um, women have made great gains um, come into their own. And, um, you know, when I started in college, 
um, I was the only woman in most of my classes. And so I got kind of acclimated to, you know, being one of only a few women in the engineering curriculum and then progressed to where I am today, surrounded by hugely powerful and talented women. But, um, you know, I would say <clears throat> for me personally, um, I didn't focus on, you know, I didn't put a lot of focus on being a woman. I I got comfortable really quickly, you know, with whatever the demographic makeup was of the the teams that I either participated in or led. I I instead focused on making sure that me as an individual contributor and a leader always kept my game really high. Um, I didn't feel like I had something to prove as a woman, but I certainly wasn't about to not be noticed for what I did because I was a woman. So I always made I always made sure my performance was high because personally, that's what I wanted to bring to the table. Um, and then I always, um, you know, just made sure that um, looked out for women on my team, making sure that they got um, not got overlooked or not got, um, you know, in any way not recognized for their great contributions as well. So, so part of being a woman and kind of growing up in an environment like this is, is also paying it forward. Um, and so where I am now in my career, I've got the opportunity, you know, to make sure that, that women get, you know, every equal opportunity available to them as any other demographic. Um, and so that's important to me, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's something I was aware of, but I never overly focused on it because I felt like, <clears throat> I felt like I needed to be me and bring my A game to the table. And as long as I did that, um, and maybe I got lucky and got in a company that, that it didn't matter whether I was male or female. Um, and certainly BAE has given that to me. Um, and progress my career, you know, smartly, uh, regardless of my gender. So I hope that helped a little bit answer your question. Okay, thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Okay, John Fredrickson has a question about um, using your technical skills through leadership. John, would you like to ask your question? Yes, definitely. And it was sort of backing off of a couple other questions that were above, but about how since initially you were in an engineering role and had an engineering degree, but now are in more of a management and senior role, do you still get to use those technical skills? And how do you sort of balance or go back and forth between the engineering and management sides? Yeah, great question, John. So I definitely, I mean, um, a company like BAE, we're a technology driven company at our heart. Right. And so many of our senior leaders started as engineers. And um, I think having that technical background makes me more successful because, you know, not that I that I go off and do a thermal analysis now or a vibration analysis or an aero analysis, but as I'm <clears throat> reviewing programs, as I'm looking at our strategy, I definitely that background. Um, gives me the confidence to ask the right kinds of questions and to make sure that what I'm hearing back intuitively makes sense to me as an engineer too. So you never lose that discipline, that training. It's just how you apply it changes a little bit as you go through your career. Where, where at first I was doing, you know, hands-on doing a lot of engineering. Now um, I'm more weighing in on things and setting strategy and my engineering leads will bring ideas to the table. And because of my background, I'm able to better understand, you know, kind of what they're talking about, how impactful it could be, whether it's a sound strategy or not. So, so technical backgrounds are great. I go STEM, you know, I, I know it's not for everybody, but it's definitely useful across the board, no matter what role, um, you know, at the end of your career you land in, it, it's useful for every single role. I hope that helps. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Okay. April had a question about um, choosing, you know, choosing the path. And you, as you were talking about the crossroads, a April, would you like to ask your question, please? Um, sure. I can't find it in the chat, but it was basically like you said that um, when you were choosing what path to go on, it's important to remember that any path will like add to your experiences but have there any been moments of doubt or regret 
through your professional career and how did you overcome that? Um, you know, I, I think um, the beauty of me getting to, to talk with you all and share with you is, you know, I get to use my rear view mirror to impart kind of guidance and wisdom to each of you. So definitely early on, I put myself in that position where, you know, I wasn't sure if I was making the right choices or not. Um, and I had to learn exactly what I told you all, which is, you know, any role, and I really don't care what it is, if you are curious and you are willing to grow and you're willing to learn, there is something to be learned in every role. Um, and the, the, the more of those that you get, you know, the, the breadth of those experiences that you can take on board, they all fill a little puzzle piece into who you will be as a leader, you know, through your career. So, so you know, I, I quickly had to kind of let it go uh, early in my career because I think I would have been driving myself crazy playing the what if game. What if I did here? What if I did here? What if I did here? And, and actually, I had the benefit of my personal board of directors and some of my mentors also telling me, let it go, right? And so I, I would say, um, you know, I'm imparting kind of my, my rearview mirror wisdom with all of you. Not, I have no skin in the game in terms of, um, you know, wanting something out of what you do with your career. My only goal today is to help you all kind of knock down some things that might have tripped me up along the way and share my experience. So, so I would say, trust me when I tell you what I tell you. And I would say, you know, reach out to others and, and, and get their perspective as well too. Um, but, you know, I, I did abandon kind of that, that, that what, what if game very early in my career and it did serve me really well. And your you know, your mindset going into whatever role you go into more than, um, you know, more than, more than accommodates, you know, what could be learned, like there's stuff to be learned if you are willing to face into a role from that perspective and you're not plotting, oh no, in order to get here, I need to go here, 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 and here first. Don't worry about it. Go here if you want, go here if you want. It will make you a more diverse uh, diverse employee with a great wealth of experience. Okay, so I think we have thank you. Oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> for one more question, um, did Tanchu? Would you like to? He's looking for some advice, and I think several of the students have reiterated a similar question. So, did, did Tanchu? Would you like to ask your question? Sure. Um, before asking my question, I would like to take some time to thank you for sharing your advice and experience with us. But my only question stems from the fact that I'm currently a leader for a very small <laughs> group. Um, so yeah, it's around like five, five, six members. So I was wondering whether, like how, how would you sort of plan ahead effectively if the research group is about you know, advanced topics like quantum computing or machine learning, something like that. And how do you do more with less? Like, I have only five people. How do you do more with that? Yeah, so, I mean, <clears throat> small teams can be very powerful. Um, sometimes it isn't the numbers you need, but it's the prioritization. And so I would say, get your team aligned around the top priorities and then go after those fiercely. Um, you know, that shouldn't be 15 things with five of you. That should be a couple things that you want to do really, really well. Um, and <clears throat> having five voices at the table um, means that you, you can listen to all of them. Because if you had 25 voices at the table, you'd be driving yourself crazy, making sure that you heard each one and you factored it in. So that's a very manageable number. You can do great things with a team of five. Um, I think the key though is, you know, don't overwhelm yourselves and take on more than you could handle for the size of your team. And, and so I find, <clears throat> I've found, um, you know, ways to, to kind of bring us together and say, okay, get aligned around the top couple of things you want to achieve. 
um, even though it will be tempting to each take on one thing individually. <laughs> there, there's a strength in, in your small numbers and in, in use it to your advantage. Because um, diversity of thought is going to bring you a much better outcome on any problem, on anything you're attempting, you know, than everybody going at it by themselves. So, so use that to your advantage. Great question. I wish you luck. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so maybe if we could sneak in one more question, because um, this is another thing that came up quite a bit. Um, Chris, Scoot, you had a question on um, the mix between an MBA and engineering. Yep, that's what I had. Could you ask your question? Yes. Uh, thanks so much for this opportunity. You know, um, I would imagine that there aren't many engineers who have MBAs and that there aren't many business people with engineering degrees. So I find this expansive background to be super unique and amazing. You know, I'm really curious. Did your business knowledge make you a better engineer? And did your engineering knowledge make you a better leader, director, manager, and as a person? Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, so I think the answer to the all of the above is yes, because... Um, you know, you, you, I, I work for a company, um, you know, that is, you know, solely focused on aerospace and defense. We're a business, we're not a not-for-profit, right? So everything I do to help our warfighter also needs to make business sense to make sure that the company can continue to be a company. Um, so <clears throat> I found that adding kind of that business acumen to my technical base really helped inform the decisions that I made um, to be better business ones. And so once I started to train myself to think like that, um, it was natural to have, you know, both sides of my brains kind of working together and, and, and kind of help um, solutioneer something that also made good business sense. Now, I would say, you know, you don't, you don't want it to const overly constrain you, right? you don't want you to be the sole judge of whether something makes business sense or not. Um, so, you know, you want to communicate and talk about that up your leadership chain too, but yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Having those two uniquely gave me the perspective of, I want to do good things technically, but I, I don't want it to sit on the drawing board table. I want it to be used. I want the warfighters to, to have it in their hands. And so how do I make sure I bring, bring good business sense together with technical and put a solution out there that the company thinks is worth selling and that we can make a profit on. Um, because whether we all like to think about it or not, if you work for a company that is, a, that is not a nonprofit, you will feel pressure to make profit. Um, and you can do both at once. I, trust me, you can really do both at once. <laughs> wow, thank you so much for that answer. That was super informative. Good, awesome. Okay, thank you. So at this time, I'd like to highlight um, Stefan Mouton and Michelle Wang, who are gonna present you with um, a token of our appreciation. Awesome. Uh, hi, Cheryl. On behalf of all of us here virtually at the Beaverwork Summer Institution, I'd like to thank you so much for the amazing talk and for giving us such um, powerful wisdom that will help us for years going down our careers. <laughs> well, thank you, Stefan. And I see Michelle popped up too. Thank you so much. And I, um, go ahead, Michelle, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, like Stefan said, thank you so much for your talk. It was really interesting to hear from like an industry perspective and like business, because a lot of times we get a lot of researchers from the university and it was really refreshing to hear a new perspective. And as our token of appreciation, we would like to give you this virtual t-shirt from Beaver Works. <laughs> That's awesome. And, um, and so I'm heading into the office this afternoon. It is there waiting for me. And I'm planning to wear it this weekend, kayaking with some of the high schoolers that I'll be with and the professionals. So I'll really be um, talking about Beaver Works Summer Institute with them. So you guys have been great. Thank you for the t-shirt. It's awesome. And um, I wish I could just personally mentor each and every one of you. Great questions, great engagement. Um, I wish you a lot of luck and I wish